Hello everyone, welcome to my channel again. I'm going to be talking about gouache today, and just to make it really clear from the beginning, I'm talking about water-based gouache. There is acrylic gouache out there, I have never used it. I know Lindsay the Frugal Crafter uses it a reasonable amount, so you'll probably see it on her channel, but I only ever use water-based gouache. People have been asking recently in the comments on her videos and in the chat on her live um, tutorials about gouache and how you use it, what it is, and I thought, well, as I use it, I may as well do a tutorial on it, and I haven't had my gouache out for about six months, so I thought it'd be nice, and, and I'll do that. So the first thing you really need to know about it is what it's actually used for, because there are some misconceptions about its use. I'll show you the brand, the main brand I use, which is Windsor & Newton Designers Gouache. I also have some tubes of Daler & Rowney Designers Gouache. I bought those, they're really old, I bought those for a pound in the clearance section in my local art store. You'll notice both companies call it Designers Gouache, not Artists Gouache. Now normally when you buy watercolour paints or acrylic paints, you'll have a student grade and an artist grade. With gouache, there is designer's grade. There's generally not a lower grade. Sometimes you might find an economy gouache, like um, the Simply range from um, Daler and Rowney springs to mind, but they're always designer's gouache. And that is because they are intended for design use. They are intended for me to paint something which will be used as the cover of a book, or it will be used on a jar of something like these cotton buds. I mean, these days that's done on a computer. But in the days where that would have been painted, it would have been painted with gouache. And those images are then scanned in, or photographed in the olden days, and then they're printed. So these images, the actual original painted images, are pretty ephemeral. They're created, photographed, and then they're no longer needed. And that means they don't need to be light fast. So the first thing you're going to find is a lot of gouaches do not have sort of the high permanence ratings that we might be used to with watercolour. So primary blue here, which is thalocyanine blue, pigment wise, is a permanent A. That's the, the highest permanence. Whereas um, primary red has a permanence B. And as you go through them, that permanence can drop off quite a bit. It's going to be sod's law now that I'll only be able to find permanent A's, but I did notice some pretty low ones. There's a permanent C there, so that's kind of fugitive. And that actually, Bengal Rose, is rhodamine. So that's the stuff they add to the binder of Opera Rose to give it its fluorescent edge. Uh, that really fugitive component of Opera Rose, and I've done a video on Opera Rose, which some of you will have seen, and I'll put it in the iCards now so you can watch it if you haven't already seen it. It's okay to use that in gouache because it's not going to be hung on the wall. That's the idea. It's just for doing a design. And let's just see if the Bengal rose... Oh, indeed, it is fluorescent. So I'll show you that when I hold it up to the camera in a minute. Um, actually, it's the same rhodamine that I used when I made my rhodamine acrylic paint that I made as well. I'll put an iCard in now about that as well, and you can see it. So... Gouache is not intended to be hung on the wall. That is not to say that you can't use it for art. You can use it to make cards, you can use it to make postcards, and those kind of more ephemeral items. You can use it within scrapbooks, you can use it within art journals where it's not going to see the light of day very often, and it is totally 100% fine. If you pick your paints correctly and go for the high permanence ones, you can hang it on the wall. It's absolutely fine. Now, I painted a painting, and if you go over to my website, which is www.the-spin-doctor.co.uk, and I'll link that now as well, you will find on there that there's a, uh, a what do they call them, tags, labels, something like that. If you look up the label called, the label called Dog Project, or search for Dog Project, you'll find a painting I did of a very, very dear friend's uh, dog that, that was um, sadly put down in January. I painted him um, as a gift for my friend um, to just sort of help him um, at that time in his life. And I painted that in gouache because I didn't want the really kind of washed out look of watercolour because... <sighs> Odd as it sounds, I think watercolour can sometimes look quite sad. 
because it's often very, very muted, beautiful washes and very misty, ethereal quality. And that's really nice. But I wanted something really bright and bold and happy. So what I did is I painted it in gouache and I did it in the style of a pop artist or in the style of a comic book. So I outlined everything in black, which, you know, you would never do in watercolour and made it a really bright, jazzy image because I thought, well, why not? I want to make it happy. We're celebrating life here, not um, remembering death. So I don't have a lot of gouache. I bought a pack of gouache, I think at Christmas kind of time, which was maybe six or seven colours. That was from Windsor & Newton. And I will, in the description below, I will link to UK and US, Amazon, all sorts of different gouache packs that you can get. So have a look there. I will search out the best deals for you so you can find the very, very cheapest options if you want to try gouache without spending an absolute fortune. The packs that have the best variety of colours in them rather than the ones that have got 200 colours but they're all crap. So I bought a small number and then to paint that painting I bought a few more to, to kind of top it up. And then there's the ones I bought in the sale. So I'll just show them to you and I'll just, I'll, I'll explain what they are a little bit later so first of all the yellows now i drew a line of black pro marker on all of them so you can see how opaque they are but i forgot to do it with primary yellow so you'll have to excuse me there so primary yellow is two dyes aralide yellow 5gx and quinophthalone yellow so pigment py74 and py138 and then permanent yellow deep is py65 which is hansa yellow 65 which many of us have used in its watercolor format um, the red, primary red is pigment red 170, naphthol red AS. Many of us will know that from acrylic painting. And then I've also got Bengal rose, not to be confused with rose Bengal, which is a similar fluorescent dye they put in your eyes sometimes at the opticians and it glows pink and they use that to detect fungal infections. And I'm a, bacteri a bacteriologist by trade, and we use Rose Bengal in the lab all the time. So I keep calling this Rose Bengal, but it's called Bengal Rose, confusingly as hell. And that, as I've already said, is rhodamine, but it's the copper ferrocyanide form of rhodamine, which is not as light fugitive as other rhodamines. 523 primary blue is just phthalo blue red shade. Um, I'm not convinced it's 100% red shade. It may have some green shade mixed with it. P um, ultramarine is pigment blue 29 ultramarine blue as one would expect it to be and then moving into the secondaries and others we've got 554 raw umber which is as raw umber is in watercolor from the same manufacturers it's um py42 yellow iron oxide and pbr7 brown iron oxide and that's very opaque Permanent Green Middle, which looks a bit like Hooker's Green, but it isn't, is PY3, which is Hansa Yellow 10G, PY74, which is Aralide Yellow 5GX, and PG7, which is Thalo Green Blue Shade. The black up here is um, Ivory Black, which is made with PBK9 Bone Black, and 748 Zinc White is made of pigment white 5, which is lithopone, and I'll come back to lithopone in a moment. Data and roundy ones, I don't know what is in them because the tubes don't have any pigment numbers on them and I can't find most of these shades. They don't seem to be manufactured anymore by that company and I can't be bothered to check really. It's not that important to me. So we've got raw sienna, semi-opaque, mint, mostly transparent, vermilion red, nearly opaque, Mars red, very nearly opaque. They're all quite opaque. That's one of the first things you will notice is very different from painting with watercolour. Now, when we buy cheap watercolour, and by cheap I mean student watercolour, not the really crap watercolour, so the Cotman's and the Aquafine's and the Georgian watercolours of this world, you know they've all got fillers in them. I think most of us know about fillers in student watercolour. Something used to pad them out. And that something is this, PW5 Lithopone. And what lithopone is, is a mixture of, I think it's zinc oxide, barium sulfide and something else. But it's basically whiter than white. It's a really beautiful, thick, white, chalky, creamy pigment. And if you mix that with a colour, depending on how fine you've ground your lithopone, you can get semi-opaque or slightly not transparent colours. And then you can sell those as student watercolours. 
or if you put lots of it in and you grind it to a much coarser grind, you can make a gouache. So that's why if you take white gouache and you add it to any watercolour at a concentration of between 7 and 15%, you can make your own gouache. So if you wanted to make, I don't know, Antwerp blue gouache, you take your tube of lithopone, you take your tube of Antwerp blue watercolour, and then basically by weight you have to do it if you're going to do it really properly, but you can do it by eye. And what I've done in the past is I've just taken a ruler and I've worked out that if I do one centimetre of Antwerp blue, I need about 1.5 millimetres of zinc white gouache. Mix them together and you've got Antwerp blue gouache. It's that simple to make your own gouache if you wanted to. So that's a way you can extend your range by just buying zinc white and using it with the watercolours that you've already got. Now, then it's not going to have the stickiness of normal gouache because gouache has got a lot more binder in it to make it really sticky and viscous. You could just add more gum arabic, but if you just want to play with gouache and get used to the style of painting, that's how I recommend you start. A tube of zinc white gouache and your tube watercolours. If you want to try gouache properly, down in the description below, there will also be zinc white in the description below, uh, but there will be packs, as I promised earlier. So what I'm going to do is show you how we use gouache versus how we use watercolour, because they are very, very different. And I'm just going to do a little bit of a, a crap painting down here using watercolour and using gouache, just to show you the main difference. Then I'm going to move over and I'm going to do a painting with watercolour and gouache using watercolour techniques. And then I'm going to do it again using gouache techniques, so you can see how you can't just use the same methodology, it won't work. Because the main point with gouache is that you're going to paint dark to light, just as we would with acrylic, just as we would with oil. It follows the same rules. You start with dark and you work your way forwards. With watercolour, you start with light and you work your way darker. You can't do that with gouache, the opacity will not let you. So actually, Rather than show you just a little sketch, let's do the drawing that I said we'd do. Now, the drawing that I said we would do is based on a drawing that is in my, in my this is my Pink Pigs um, watercolour paper sketchbook. This poppy that I've used recently for other things is just a blowout, nothing special. Hooker's green and two shades of red watercolour, which I think were Pyrol Red and Scarlet Lake. I'm going to recreate that. I'm going to use permanent green middle, primary red and Bengal rose. And I'm going to do it using the watercolour techniques. So I'm going to do it. Ooh, that page is not important. doesn't matter if it sticks because they're not dry. I'm going to do this as we would do it as if we were painting watercolour. And you'll see it'll be a total disaster. So I've got my little daisy palette here that's just thrown water everywhere because some idiot, namely me, forgot he'd put some water in his palette in the middle to wash his brush with and has now fired water all over himself and is now soaking wet like an idiot. Sorry about that, true professionalism at all times with the spin doctor. So I'm going to put some primary red which is 524. Note this comes in 14 milliliter tubes. These are about the same price as a 5 mil watercolour tube, just to give you a rough idea. It lasts ages because you don't need much. Now you can, and I indeed do, put it into palettes and dry it. If you're going to do that, you need to add a lot more glycerin than you would when you were painting with watercolour. So if you're putting a student watercolour into a palette, you would add to a th a, about a third of a 5ml tube, you'd add two or three drops of glycerin. I would say three times that amount to the same amount of paint. There is very little glycerin in gouache by nature, and the reason is that because it's intended to paint from the tube, it doesn't crack when dry when it's a thin film, so there's just no need, so they don't put so much in. Again, it's one of its properties. It's not that they're being cheap, it's just that that's how gouache is, that's how you're meant to use it. So you're meant to work from the tube, but if you want to put it into a palette, you can just beware you need lots and lots of glycerin to do it. It will crack, it will fall out. You will also find that it doesn't wet as easily as watercolour does, but it does re-wet. Just spray it with water and leave it for 15 minutes. 
paints absolutely fine. If you put your brush on and it feels a bit chalky, spray it with more water and leave it a little bit longer. It will be absolutely fine. You'll have no problems. So when I paint my poppy normally, um, I'm going to change brushes because I'm doing it for you guys. I'll use bigger. So I'm using a Daylon 12 round. So this is um, Daylon and Rowney's professional watercolour brush. It's a very nice brush. It's synthetic and it's kind of designed to be like sable but better. I'm deliberately using dirty water and the reason for that is it allows you to see where I'm putting the water I think. Let me just move you guys along a little bit. I want you to see where I'm putting it and I found the easiest way to film that is to either use dirty water or put a little bit of blue dye in the water and I'm using dirty water because it's economical and better for the environment if I make the most use of it. So you put on quite a lot of water in this technique and you need to have um, to do this a drinking straw and uh, if you're asthmatic like me make sure you've got your inhaler on standby because I did um, give myself a coughing fit yesterday so you would normally with your watercolors add enough water to them to get a decent um, wash type consistency so we're pretending these are watercolors and you spot it in and normally it would travel really rapidly over the whole area and you can see gouache spreads a bit and then it kind of stops that's a property of gouache it does not spread as easily remember with student watercolors when you do that and they don't spread very much because they're student watercolors and they're weighed down with lithopone same issue it's very hard to get the paint to just cover the whole area. You know, these are dye-based paints, but they're behaving like a mineral-based paint because of the sheer amount of lithopone. So that's the first thing you're going to notice. So just spot some more in there. And the idea of this method is that you just sort of spot it all over and get the poppy nice and wet. And whilst it's still swimming, we do that blowout effect. So we take our straw and we just sort of blow in this direction and this direction. So, And that was considerably easier than when I did this yesterday. There we go. Now what I then do is I dry my brush and I use that dry brush to soak out some of that paint and what you'll see when I hold this up to the camera is it looks very much like those really cheap chalky watercolors I reviewed from uh, Flying Tiger Copenhagen these ones um, yesterday in that if I look at that you've got those river deltas of chalkiness and that's because gouache is not designed to be used with this volume of water so it's granulating because it's not meant to do this it's meant to be stuck on the paper and it's getting upset so I take a little bit of that permanent green middle now and I usually spot it in along the bottom and it would normally if I was using hookers green it would travel quite far and then I would paint down a row here and some of the red would bleed down that green and it would leave me with a nice chalky finish a nice brown kind of line down the stem and that looks very pretty when I do that with watercolour but with gouache that's just going to sit there so I'm going to paint that with watercolour now on the other side of the paper to show you how it should have looked if I'd done it with watercolour. To show you why you can't use watercolour techniques with gouache. Now I've got some water on my paper that's not meant to be there. So let's just clean that off. I'm not bothered too much about using... I, I reuse tissue, uh, kitchen paper until it's absolutely filthy because I don't believe in wasting paper I can still use even though it looks a bit grubby with paint it's still okay I wouldn't use it for lifting but it's okay for drying my brush on so I've got that nice and wet there I'm sorry it's slightly in shadow isn't it yeah that's going to balance I think Some cantilevered notebook here get this to be sort of poppy shape this one's going to be useless in terms of shape but let's not worry too much about shape so I'm going to use Windsor Red Deep, which is a pyrrole red. So I'll just add a little bit of water to that and mix it around to make a light wash 
on the top and then I will drop that in Now normally I would make it much runnier than this but you can see spreading reasonably not too well and then I'm going to add some Scarlet Lake just to this middle area to give it a bit of contrast so we can get two shades going there now this paper is not very good this is pink pigs own brand watercolor paper and i had a conversation with them on twitter and they were totally unapologetic about the quality of their paper and claimed it's amazing uh, the whole world make watercolor paper in three varieties don't they they make cold press hot press and rough pink pigs make matte smooth and something else i think it's maybe textured uh, which I think are meant to be kind of like hot press, super hot press and cold press maybe. This is meant to be one of them and it is really not a watercolour paper texture. What it seems to me they've done is they've got a drawing paper and had it sized. So I think this is actually a drawing paper that they've sized. I don't think it's really a watercolour paper proper. It's okay for practicing on and sketching but that's where it begins and ends I'm afraid and I won't be buying these pads again. They do do a Bockingford pad which I will be buying but I won't be buying this again. The paper is really odd, it doesn't behave well. So Hooker's Green next. Quite a light wash there and I spot in along the bottom to make the middle of the poppy and then I do my line down and with any luck some of that red if i can encourage it a little bit will channel down there there we go and just give me that slight brown edge now of course i made a deliberate mistake there everybody i forgot to do my blowout i put my stem on too early So there we are and I'll just remove a little bit of that excess um, paint and what I normally do is once this is dry I create some deliberate backgrounds to create two petals but I'll just show you the main differences. The watercolour is lovely transparent. It has gone a bit granulated, but that's not actually granulation. That is pilling of the paper. That is where the paper has actually pilled because it just doesn't behave very well at all. I have got a review of Pink Pig's books coming up. I just haven't had the energy to film it yet. But it generally works okay. With gouache, you find it generally stays where it is. So the pink has stayed where it is. The red has stayed around the outside. The green hasn't moved. It's just sort of sat there. So that's one of the main things you have to get used to is you can't use the watercolour wet and wet techniques with gouache. They don't work. <sighs> Sorry. I'm just getting some kitchen paper off the floor where I store it. I'm just going to do what I call the Reevely roll after Diane Reevely, her way of mopping up wet paint is to take the whole kitchen roll and um, roll it over the page, which I think is actually pretty innovative. And what it does is it gives you interesting textures and then you just have that weird print there and you just throw one sheet away, but it's so much easier than taking a sheet off the roll and trying to blot it up. That was just to get rid of it so that I can turn the page over. But you'll see gouache doesn't come off very easily. It doesn't lift. So once it's on there, it tends to stay on there. That was what I wanted to show you there. So let's talk about how we would actually do a gouache painting proper. We have to work. Have to, have to, have to work dark and build up to light. And we do that by using lithopone. We do that by adding zinc white layers and painting over them. So I'll just demonstrate this. I've got um, some primary... All thumbs today. I'm procrastinating. I'm supposed to be cleaning the kitchen. But, well, life's too short, really. And cleaning the kitchen's boring. Making a gouache tutorial is kind of fun. So I thought I'd do that. 
Sorry, sue me. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we would paint yellow over these darker colours by using a layer of lithopone in the form of zinc white. So I'll just stir up that zinc white because it's a bit messy and it's got an eyelash in it. I hope it's an eyelash. <laughs> Dear me. <laughs> how did that get in the tube of paint? That's someone at Windsor and Newton, it's not me. So, just over here, I will paint some dark colours. I'll paint some green. And I'll just, again, to make the point that watercolour techniques don't work with gouache, I'll paint some Bengal rose adjacent, and you'll see that they don't flood into one another. They kind of glaze. You get a slight overlap there, but you don't get what you would get with watercolour is that they'd immediately start blending and you don't you just don't get that there is no blend going on there now if we wanted to paint yellow over the top of that let's do it anyway because it'd be fun just incidentally when you're painting gouache you use your same utensils as watercolour and you can interchange between watercolour brushes with watercolour and with gouache. The same brushes won't get damaged if you interchange. If you're using acrylic gouache though you can't use those brushes with watercolour and I would suggest you use acrylic brushes with acrylic gouache. I just think it's going to give you a better effect. So if I were to paint a line of yellow on it now it kind of glazes I and mean, because this is wet it has mixed in so it has gone orange here but it's basically glazed because you can see through it. The yellow is not completely opaque. So how do we get around that? Well, first of all, we have to wait for that to dry. And because I decided in my infinite wisdom to get some drawers down here that you can't see, and I put my heat gun in them, I can't just get hold of it quickly. So I'll do the Reevely roll on the edge there taken off a little bit too much paint but the green I think is still opaque enough and I'll start putting on some zinc white so you would normally paint let's say we want to have a triangle of yellow it's still a bit wet you'd paint a triangle of zinc white and you can see that that is still too wet so I'll just do one here and the good thing with gouache the really good thing with it is if you make a mistake you just paint white over it and it won't add thickness like acrylic. It's thin and milky if you use a little bit of water. It's kind of like whitewashing. You can just erase the issue, paint over it, no problems. I'll put a little bit here as well. Now there are a few channels that have got brilliant gouache techniques. And one technique that's really common is to do what's called a tonal underpainting. And then glaze over the top. And that's actually what I used in the dog project in the end. I did a tonal underpainting in black and white gouache, so I used ivory black and zinc white, worked out all the values, painted the painting, and then I glazed over it rather than having to mix up all those different colours at the right value and the right colour, I kind of cheated with it. So I think while that's drying, because I can't put any green, any yellow over it right now, I'm going to do a little tonal underpainting for you guys on the right, and you can see how they look. So let's just do the dark patch. So we'll do some dark here. And then we'll do a sort of 50-50 gray, a light gray. And I do a mostly white, not quite pure white. It's got some black in it. And if I let that dry and paint over it with a thin glaze of red, what that's going to look like is three sort of shades of red, a mid, dark and a light. And that tonal underpainting, if you do it in black and white, is known as painting en glissade, to paint in grey in French. And en glissade painting is really good if you're a beginner and you're struggling with values and colours, try doing a few paintings on glissade. So get yourself a black and a white, 
or if you're in watercolor just use a black or mix up like jane's gray which is um burnt sienna and french ultramarine together named after jane blundell she quite arrogantly named it after herself but in quite a sweet way as a parody of Payne's gray so try something like that and just try painting a painting where you focus on the values so the the dark and light and bugger the colors don't think about them at all just learn to paint on side for a while it can be a really good way to improve your paintings and if you want to extend on that you can also paint on veldai which is just using green there's on brunei where you just use a brown and i love kaput mortuum for that I think uh, Oxide of Chromium Green is really good for Onveldi because it's got that darkness that means it is so near to black to start with that it makes it easy. So you could not paint on Brunei using something like um, Gold Ochre because it's so pale. You're starting at a near to white and then you can't make it any darker So because you, you can't add black to it or purple or anything to darken it off you because that is whatever you whatever color you choose that is your black yeah so you have to start with a dark color you can paint um a red equivalent which i think is called en sanguine where you would use a dark 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 red like maybe even cad red deep might be too light and you call that your black your 100 percent value and you work to white if you're doing that in watercolor it can be difficult to do it without a white so you would want to use a white rather than use your paper as your white you'd want to mix in a white and when you're using that technique on glissade with gouache you can make lovely tonal underpaintings and in the description below i will link to a few other youtubers who i learned from a lot about tonal underpaintings when i was doing it for the dog project because i wanted to learn how to do that with gouache and it is so easy so so easy the trick is to make sure that your overpainting is translucent so don't do it with a super opaque dark pigment like the green if you're going to do that you need to water it down a lot until it is really soft and then trust that your dark underlayer is going to show through and then it'll be okay i found it a really easy way and a really intuitive way to paint because you start on the page with the black areas and then you work towards the light areas and maybe at some point i'll do a tutorial on it but to be honest there are people out there already with brilliant tutorials on it so i don't really feel the need to do one so um have a look at those if you're interested in tonal underpaintings but the idea is that you have your underpainting and then you glaze so you would need to learn to glaze if you don't already know how to do it I'll just see if i can blot a little bit of this moisture away yeah, that's nearly dry it's not perfect so we're going to get a little bit of bleed through from this background i found it useful to do the underpainting and wait overnight and then do the next the colored layers and then after each color wait overnight and i did it over a week and i'll talk a little bit about mixing and gouache in a minute but first of all i'm going to use that bengal rose really diluted to just glaze a rectangle over this Can you see, if you couldn't see that there, it would just look like you've got three intensities of the purple, pink, whatever you want to call it. And I'll do the same with the, the yellow. Now the yellow is a bit more opaque. And if that under layer were totally dry, it would be more striking. But the idea is that you get the impression of a kind of dark yellow a mid yellow and a bright yellow at the other end but glazing the colors is really easy in, in gouache it, it lends itself really well you can see there where i've got the yellow and where the pink's underneath it's become orange and that relates into the color mixing that i need to tell you about really shortly i'm just going to try and mop out a little bit of this liquid on these triangles of white that i put in they're a little bit sticky, but I think I can paint over them. Yeah, there you go. So that's how you would paint yellow on pink without glazing. So this is glazing, and this is with a white layer in between, so you don't get glazing. So what I mean by glazing is, by painting yellow over pink, I've created the mixture, which in this case is orange. And up here, I've avoided the mixture by having a layer of white in between. So it's kind of like rebooting as far as the paper 
often, if that makes sense, but that's how I think of it. That's kind of how I work with it. And glazing over black just gives you different shades and tones, and that's how that would work. And you can still do a coloured kind of mix over it. That works. Mixing on the paper doesn't work quite so well in gouache because you can't do wet and wet very easily, as you saw with the poppies. Now, when it comes to mixing, gouache really obeys, rather than when we mix normally, we would work with primaries being red green sorry red blue and yellow in gouache there is a tendency to work in the process color universe which is cyan magenta yellow and black rather than working in yellow blue red and white being the paper yeah so that's kind of how we tend to work a bit more in gouache and gouache is often sold uh such that you don't actually get a red that mixes uh, in the same way a watercolour red might mix. In fact, if you add yellow to that magenta kind of red, you actually get a normal red. So just mix that in a second. Now I've got a gouache colour chart that I painted that shows all the mixes and that will show you how um how gouache mixes you see you get a red um in in the process universe so i'll just grab that and i'll be back okay this is my color chart that i painted a little while ago it's on a 100 percent cotton cold press paper and i did a few things on it first of all i did some values so i did zinc white and i worked my way up to ivory black just to play with values and then i did a whole load of colour mixing, you know, normally people do like a whole square, I only ever do half the square. And then here, I took whatever the colour was, so primary yellow, and I mixed it with zinc white. I took permanent yellow deep, mixed it with zinc white, primary red with zinc white. So the actual colours in here are permanent yellow, primary yellow, permanent yellow deep, primary red, Bengal rose, primary blue ultramarine that's where they are on, on the on the sheet so if you were to mix for example primary yellow with bengal rose so a yellow and a, and a magenta you get red now that's not kind of how you would normally work you'd normally mix a red and a blue to get a magenta but that doesn't work in this universe it's a little bit different to that so you would mix a primary blue with a primary red would give you that kind of washed out lavender instead. So very often you are working what they call a primary red um, is actually a magenta. So you are working very much in a CMYK mixing world. And that is something you kind of have to get used to a little bit is a slight difference in your mixing. Now, if you've used before what are called process primaries, in acrylic particularly, you would already be used to working in that world. It tends to give you a slightly unnatural look. It does make it harder to get very natural flesh tones or very natural greens because it will give you very vivid colours instead. It is possible to buy red gouache that is not magenta oriented. You can buy a um, a, a hotter red, a, a more orangey red, and then you can work in the normal universe. So just be aware that the primaries can be more CMYK primaries than um, RYB primaries. If you want to kind of have a play with that without buying gouache, you can kind of achieve it by using, I think if this is correct, I think cobalt blue, Hansa yellow, and quinacridone magenta, and ivory black watercolour will give you near to CMYK as you can get in watercolour. Some watercolour brands do actually sell CMYK watercolour sets for people that are kind of sitting in between and wanting to try it. But if you want to try it properly, move to gouache. So you can see as these paints are drying now, you've got the yellow and the magenta. And then where the glaze has overlapped, you've got a lovely orange. I managed to get a red and a pink by mixing here. My glazing over this tonal underpainting gave me 
tints and shades of yellow and pink and then where I mix them I got a red because that's in the CMYK colour universe. I would say if you do want to paint really really natural paintings that look exactly like the real world and are photorealistic and beautiful in that sense stick to watercolour because watercolour gives you the ability in, in my view to make closer matches to the natural world because within the CMYK universe the gamut um, that's a lovely word G-A-M-U-T which basically means range of colours perceivable to the human eye that you can mix is very slightly different and it's kind of hard to explain it but basically if you imagine all the colours that could ever possibly exist in the universe including ultraviolet and infrared are contained within that box the human eye can only see some of them because we can't see ultraviolet, we can't see infrared, we can't see x-rays and gamma rays. So we can only see a, a, a subset of all the colours that exist in the world. Within that range, RGB mixing, sorry, RYB mixing, because we're, we're, we're pigments, not light, can give us not quite all, but a fair number of them. CMYK, I think, does something like that. It gives you even fewer of the ones we can see but in theory, you could get ones we can't see. So subtleties that we could not make out. Colours where we could not tell the difference between them, but they are actually different if you look at them through a computer or whatever. So that's just kind of... That was... and it's annoy, I'm annoying myself now that that's a gross oversimplification of how colour gamuts and universes work. But the idea is CMYK has got a limited range particularly in certain areas like subtle browns and greens are harder to achieve they are really easy to achieve with red green and yellow primaries so that's one of the downsides that's why we don't work cmyk for everything cmyk is what's used in printing um it's what's used not in pantone printing but in laser printers and all those other types of printing uh cmyk pigment paints are printing inks are used and that is why gouache because you're using it for design work let's say designing something for a magazine they want to be able to scan that in and match that original painting as well as they can with cmyk printing inks so if i paint something with cmyk colors on here and it looks all lovely and beautiful and nice if that gets scanned in and sent to a company that want to print it with cmyk it will print very close to my original image how the artist intended it. But if I paint it in reds, greens and yellow, reds, blues and yellows, sorry, and they scan it in and try and print it in CMYK, it won't give an exact match and I'll have to do some level of color, of calibration and correction. So by painting in the same colour range that they're going to print in, you can make their lives easier, basically. That's a kind of shortened version of of why it's important for designers to work in that universe. So that is Gouache 101 for beginners. If you want more gouache tutorials, please comment below, like this video, comment below that you're interested in gouache, what areas of it you're interested in, anything you'd like me to paint in gouache, I can have a go at that for you. I can do some live tutorials now. Um, I'm in a position to do that. So let me know what you want and similarly if there's anything that you didn't quite follow from this video please comment i'm i always reply to everybody um as best as i can and similarly if you see any deals that are better than the ones that i've linked to in the description please link them in the comments because then people can get the best deal possible now i use affiliate links when i'm linking because it brings a little bit of money back to me that I reinvest in this channel, basically. I don't take any personal profits at all. I use everything to kind of fuel this channel and buy me supplies to use for this channel. So it is a way of kind of funding this work is to use affiliate links. But if you want to use a different store or you don't agree with affiliate schemes or you don't want to use them, do what you like. I won't kind of force people to to go down that road i won't delete comments that contain links to other suppliers that's all fine as long as it's within youtube's rules i will say that um whenever you use an affiliate link with me or anyone else you don't pay a penny more than if you'd just gone to like amazon and searched for the item yourself all you're basically doing is we're getting a finder's fee for showing you that that item exists amazon are making less profit 
you are paying exactly the same as you would ordinarily pay and they're giving a little cut to us and it is really small um i can't tell you exactly how much we get because i don't think we're allowed to but we're not on kind of 10 percent commission or anything ridiculous like that it's really small but it does really help youtubers myself and others to fuel our channels thank you all very much goodbye